Welcome to a special edition of One on One. Our guest needs no introduction. However, let me at least say it was a privilege to make a return visit to Professor Wale Shoenka's abode. At a time when nations were under lockdown due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we had the rare opportunity to unlock global issues with an astute thinker, and we certainly took full advantage of that. In this two-part edition, you can look forward to hearing the mind of Professor Wale Shoenka on the topical issues of the day, from Amotekun to the threat to national security, to strengthening of state governance, to showery and the spirit of true change, to the distraction that is the spate of frivolous bills from our House of Senate. We compare global best and worst practices in the face of the pandemic with an audacity and forwardness that can only come with experience and resilience. Okay, so we feel very privileged to be having this second outing to what I've come to term a haven in the forest, uh, Professor Wale Shoenka's abode here in Abiokuta. And um, yes, we look forward to returning almost as friends, coming on a visit rather than a formal uh, interview. So thank you for having us in your home. You're welcome. Um, 2020 seems to be a year full of headlines, in my opinion anyway. I don't know if other people feel like that. And I remember watching you make a statement on the Never Again conference where you, I'm starting with, with that because that's how the year sort of began. You said that you felt Amotekun was the best New Year present you, you ever had. Um, do you still feel that way? Uh, very much so. It uh, certainly, it applied to that, uh, uh, to, the, to the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's both uh, a practical um, entity as well as a symbolic one. For me, it's uh, not just security, it's political, it's sociological, and among the concerns which one has had, the deterioration of human contact, of humanity, just that very sensibility towards other human beings. I believe that um, units like Amotekon will, uh, will rectify quite a bit of that, yes. Okay, um, what was the genesis for you and your involvement in, in that project? Well, heaven knows what sticks in the minds of politicians when you speak to them. But very often they seem to ignore you uh, and then they spring a surprise. I can take you back to a meeting which we had, oh dear, I'm bad memory, because I actually asked for the date mm -hmm. not so long ago and I've lost the year again, but it was at least... Um, Three years ago, I think it was, uh, and it took place in uh, Oshun State, Oshobo, in the guest house um, of um, Ari Boshola was then governor. And I called that meeting of uh, governors. Uh, two of them attended, uh, other sent representatives, as well as some leaders, some Yoruba leaders. Okay. Uh, it must be at least three years. It's more than, definitely, definitely. Now I remember, because it was the beginning of the real aggressiveness of, um, of the, of the so-called herdsmen, whom we still thought at the time were Boko Haram. And the meeting was to tell them, listen, these people are here. I use the expression Boko Haram. I said, they've infiltrated, they have sleepers all around us, inside us. They are chasing our, off uh, farmers from their farms. Some of them, in fact, had bought uh, farmlands. And I said, these are not the same as the herdsmen we used to meet in the forest. This is a very different breed entirely. And again, as I said, with all thought, they were Boko Haram. Later on, it turned out mm -hmm. that they were the herdsmen. And I, so I asked them, what are you doing to defend our, our land, our, our, our territory? Uh, are you waiting on the center? Or are you taking some kind of action? We had a long discussion. I won't tell you the other names, those mm -hmm. who were present, but I can tell you that virtually every state was represented. You know, mm -hmm. yes. either the governor himself was there or else a leader from there. It was a very robust meeting. Mm -hmm. Senator, there were a couple of senators. And uh, I like to think, I like to believe that meetings like that, not just necessarily that one, but that meetings like that contributed to the structured thinking of this, we'll call them new breed governors, if you like, who then put everything together and said, look, why don't we just, you know, collaborate and have a unit? That's all I know about my own involvement okay. in it. Okay, so it was a 
surprise. That's why I said, what a marvelous New Year okay, present. Okay. So you, you didn't <coughs> entirely predict it? I, I didn't just, I didn't predict. I was asking for action. Yes. I, I don't waste time on prediction. Mm. You know, I was asking for action. I'd seen things. I'd seen enough to agitate me and invite them to have a meeting. So would, what would you say about um, the concerns of those who say uh, such an outfit is open to abuse? Of course, especially in this country, everything is open to abuse. Everything, even the best intentions, they have a built-in, in this country in particular, they have a built-in 85% abuse potential. Mm. The police, as a structure, is abused. Uh, religion, you have churches, <laughs> are abused. Mosques are abused. So why should we expect different? But knowing that, we have a responsibility to anticipate and to build structures in there. You know, I'm, I've told them I'm willing to come and address these people, you know, when they start going and let, make, make them understand that they're not there to bully uh, others. Uh, that others are citizens just like themselves and that their primary duty is to the people and to their conscience. Uh, so I am optimistic and having met uh, a number of the governors who are involved, I am confident that something will emerge from this which will be a model to be emulated by others in the nation. I mean, if I'm following your train of thoughts correctly, mm. I, I seem to see that you are an advocate for stronger uh, states or federating units. You seem to be going in that direction to mm. strengthen the governors rather mm. than the dependency mm. which we have currently on the center. Yes. Am I right in, in that? Very much so, very much so. Mm. For instance, this Emotekno, you understand, the governor wouldn't, once, if it had been in, you know, on the ground already, the governor wouldn't even need to energy, um, spend so much energy in sensitizing people. It just because the Amatakun is drawn from the grassroots, from the people, from the markets, mm. the factories, you know, uh, teachers, you know. And you just give an instruction, go back to your units, your places and so on. Tell them this is what is happening. Uh, gather them together, in addition, with local, work with local governments and so on, and say that this is the law now. This is where we're making this law and we're going to be here to enforce it. So work with us, and so on. Finito. Okay, yes, well, I guess you, you may have a point because security is very much at the heart of, of nation building. Absolutely, um, it's central to yeah. it. Looking at the next, if we're going chronologically through the year, um, the next time I saw you again feature, which was a pleasant surprise, was in court in Abuja, where you were alongside, I'm sure you'd attended other events, but that struck me, uh, where you were side by side with uh, Shori subsequent to his release. Um, but I remember the interview I did with you where you said your marching days were over. So I'm curious, what made you take that step to show yourself <laughs> publicly like that? Um, Chauvary uh, and his uh, partner, they represent a, <clears throat> a certain tendency, a certain, um, a certain instinct, a certain temperament, which is very much, which is very close to mine. And that is the, the refusal to accept the unacceptable. Okay. Yeah. The intolerable, you know, the, to accept glaring contradictions within society. I'm not saying that he went about it the, per, the best way, the perfect way. He, he, we've talked, you know, there are certain flaws in what he was trying to do. No question at all about that. But he uh, separated himself from those young Grumbletonians who think that all they have to do is sit and uh, insult their betters on, um, you know, on the internet, <laughs> uh, attribute things to them. It never occurs to them that they can get up and say, okay, uh, let's forget these old fogies. They betrayed us, so now let's move. So he represents what I consider the positive Proactive. axis of dissatisfaction. He was not just a lazy, you know, um, grumbling kind of individual. And so I had given up. Uh, well, not completely, because I, I knew there were lots of them about that. But uh, uh, to see him making that kind of effort, he and his followers, you know, because quite a few of them, was very encouraging. It sort of injected um, uh, new oxygen in my bloodstream. <laughs> and I felt that the very least I could do, I wasn't going to match with him or anything of the sort, I've told him that bluntly. But 
I needed to be there for him to understand that some of us do understand what he's trying to express. Okay, and you, you did make a statement by that. Mm -hmm. um, going again through the year, you know, we got to a point where we are now, where coronavirus seems to have arrested everybody's attention and everybody seems a bit, um, you say, mesmerized by what's going on. Mm -hmm. Did you see that? I mean, at the time we saw the outbreak in Wuhan, could you have predicted that the world would be coming to a standstill the way it has now? Well, we all knew that the world was moving towards the crisis, but we used to give you the expression migration. I used to think that it's both the migration, the migration waves and the implications of the attitude, especially of the Western world okay. towards migration, uh, on the one hand, on the other, the rise of what I call religious lunas, lunacy, okay. religious fundamentalism. Now, the combination of those two was certainly going to put the world on the, on the brink. But I never thought about disease, no. Uh, we'd had Ebola, we had Lassa fever, fever. We had uh, uh, Asian flu and so on and so forth. And one thought, uh, my mind certainly didn't go towards a pandemic, especially one of this nature, no. But definitely the world was moving towards, and still is moving towards a crisis. I mean, uh, you're someone who reflects and observes human beings and the way they respond, and even societies. Mm -hmm. Have you observed so far in the way uh, nations and civilizations, in a sense, are responding to this pandemic? Have you? Um, picked up on anything worthy of documenting that you feel, you know, looking back, we should really chronicle mm -hmm. for the sake of prosperity? Uh, worthy of commenting upon, yes. Worthy of emulating, big question mark. Okay. For instance, see how some national leaders actually show themselves for what they are. Look at uh, Donald Trump, trying to, my good friend, Donald <laughs> Trump, I've given up on that man. He, he never <laughs> sees his... I always say, please stop surprising me. Stop surprising. Stop saying, telling me you are, you are right from the very beginning. You know, but he disappoints me. Mm. And see him trying to buy up, you know, you know, there's a new kind of vaccine yes. uh, produced the by a German firm. In, so, and trying to buy up, using the dollar power to sweep up the entire product of that German company. And he's actually so naive to think that, yes, even though people feel that money is good and there's nothing wrong with money, that that company would actually sell him without even letting its government know or whatever. But in any case, heaven knows what goes on in his head, if anything ever does, apart from tweeting, um, that he would actually sweep up the entire product from that company when at that point, as a true leader, you should be meeting with others, you know, on the um, internet or whatever, the way they communicate without coming to infect one another, you know, and say, listen, this thing is going on in Germany. What can we do to quickly ac accelerate the production and also see that there's a kind of equitable distribution in places where it's needed? I can think of Italy, for instance, to be the first to benefit from this, uh, you know, th this thing, from mm -hmm. the point of, even from strategic controlling, yeah. because what's going on in Italy up till this moment is really yeah. horrifying. Yeah. And then Spain next door. There he is, the man wants to buy, wanted to buy up the whole of the product of that. Society. What kind of a world leader is that? Time to go on a quick break. When we return, we'll get straight back to business. You're watching One on One with Professor Wale Shoinka. This is a global affliction. You know, you must come together, work together, see how, whether we're talking about masks, we're talking about hand sanitizers, we're talking about miracle germ killers, whatever. It's a global issue. And so this is one of the kind of leadership we should not emulate. On the other hand, uh, I've said in a different context, I pointed to the experiment which has been done in Sweden, okay. which is doing things a bit differently. 
And why am I attracted to that experiment? Let me tell you a little bit about what was happening to me before I came into self-quarantine uh, yes. to make sure that I don't infect people if I brought it back with me. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to go to Ghana. I had a, a lecture there, yeah, which is uh, almost, which involved in the government, the um, Foreign Affairs Institute and so on with the government back in. It's a very important lecture. And I was supposed to stop there, <coughs> give that lecture before coming into Nigeria. Of course, they also decided to cancel at the last moment. In fact, I ended up landing in Abuja since I couldn't find a flight into Lagos, into Abuja and came to Lagos. That's one. Two, are two events in Nigeria following immediately. One was the launch of my book, Beyond Aesthetics, and the other, the World Poetry Day, which a lot of work had gone into. Now, left to me, personally, Walushinika, none of those three events will be cancelled. I believe that there's a way in which you could have that kind of lecture, obeying the COVID protocols, you reduce drastically, of course, the number of people will be there normally. You use technology, you know, so that the event is not lost. Mm -hmm. It's not the event itself. It's a question of you, you give people confidence, hope, that humanity can control even epidemics like this, that within the epidemic, life goes on. And the same thing applies to the World Poetry Day thing in which I was centrally involved and the launching. We could still, in my view, have held those uh, events. But the moment the supporting bank you know, uh, said, we think we should cancel, I said, fine. The moment um, uh, my publisher and the others said, well, uh, World Poetry Day has also been cancelled, let's cancel this one. I didn't agitate. If they had not been my events, I probably would have picked one and said, I will stage it myself, maybe even just in these premises. Mm -hmm. Because there's a way in which you can defy without undue risk. Yeah. And we're all gamblers, we're all of this. Everything we're doing is a gamble. But within limits. There are ways in which you can assert, you can, you can make people fight, you know, fight any kind of affliction, any kind of incursion, you know. And this one, my view, my model, my instinct, my temperament goes towards the Swedish model, okay. in which you don't cancel everything. You lock down, or well, you don't totally lock down, you know. There are events, schoolrooms, for instance, yes, you move in, you use technology, so there's virtual teaching and so on and so forth. But you still have events, events which can be organized along the dictates of Mr. COVID. I'm not denying <laughs> its, its supremacy or anything of this sort. Okay. But one doesn't lie down and die. Yeah. This, I believe that human instinct, and I've spoken about the future. If you, if you say, if you recognize the fact that this thing is, is of such enormity, that a new order must come out of it, then you don't wait for it to terminate itself. You begin constructing, you know, either symbolically or through events or through mental reconditioning, etc., etc. You begin reconstructing that new order right away. There's nothing which I'm doing here beyond working, reading, going through the bush and so on. It gives all of us time to think, mm. you know, Nothing really new comes up, but you rethink, yeah. you know. You reposition, look at the new structures, you communicate with the outside world. Uh, and so within your own unit, you keep up that fight, you know, for the future. Yeah. So that's why I'm attracted to the Swedish model, which I'm monitoring. I don't say it'll be the best thing for here, but I think that aspects of it can be usefully deployed here. And that is more easily done when let us say a lockdown is a decision of the state rather than from miles in, away somewhere in uh, Asu, Asu Rock. Yeah, we'll have to come back to the issue of the lockdown, but for now I want to, following your train of thought, uh, um, when you talk about the, my, the mindset of people and the spirit, the fighting spirit, um, and a lot of what we see on social media, that comes to mind as well. And also remembering that the last time we spoke, you were saying you would write a book called The Republic of Liars. 
I don't know what role you feel the media and in particular social media have played in the midst of all of this, you know, because we feel that there's been an overload, a deluge even, mm -hmm. of information, misinformation mm -hmm. at this time. How do you feel people are exposing themselves in that public forum? Okay, let me tell you the truth, mm. that I have not, during this epidemic, gone to the social media, oh, well. because I think I'll just be depressed out of my mind. <laughs> so I've sent out from time to time to newspapers. I go to newspapers online, not just this country's newspapers. I watch sections of um, 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 Al Jazeera, Sky News, uh, CNN. CNN has become lately too depressing for me. Oh. In fact, you have the statistics and you see what's happening at New York Hospital. I was mm. in New York recently and to see a city like that going down, I don't want to see it again. Yeah. I already know what's there and I'm communicating with my colleagues, not just in New York, no, all over the world, mm. Italy, everywhere. So I inform myself that way. But I don't, social media, especially of this nation, depresses me. Not just depresses me, it makes me uh, murderous sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I like to keep my blood pressure down. <laughs> That's a good advice for others to follow. Yeah. Um, okay, let's bring it back to home affairs a bit. Um, and maybe track back a bit before Corona hits and we're preoccupied with other things. Were you, I want to get your take on the various bills, we had several bills that came through the House mm -hmm. uh, that perplexed some of us because we couldn't make sense of, of where they were coming from. Mm -hmm. So, for example, what's your reaction to the generator ban, the um, rehabilitation bill um, and the social media bill, those kind of bills that mm -hmm. left us sort of confused mm -hmm. a bit? A lot of those distractions, distractions, these people who say they govern us, they always want to turn our minds away from essentials. And so they distract and they dissipate our energy. Look at the amount of energy we spend unnecessarily on a bill like the, um, the freedom of um, social media, the uh, hate, hate speech. Hate speech. Mm. You say you want to start killing people if they spread hate. Uh, people have been spreading hate since eternity. Social media, you have to close it down completely. You have to execute at least 90% of those who work on social media. You want to shoot all of them? So what kind of a bill is there? You can reinforce laws of libel to take into consideration the technological uh, the, uh, advance that we all praise, the abuse of technology and so on. But you don't sit and waste days when you should be passing more serious bills. You know, uh, bills, you go back again, bills against uh, homosexuality, you know, people who were found I, mean, I looked through the terms, using, uh, uh, expressing affection in public of the same sex, that kind of thing. Just leave adults severely alone. What consenting adults do is not a business of legislation, you know, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's one recent one. Um, uh, which one was it now? Oh, it was, well, I, I was very <laughs> happy to see very strong editorials mm. against, against this. Okay. What is this? So our uh, legislators need really to be taken to task. You mm. see, it's things like that which get the goat of young people like Shori, and then he says, revolution now. Yes. They, they say, enough of this nonsense. That's actually all they're saying. They're not saying, they're not saying take up cudgels and uh, axes and march on and start a bloody revolution. No, that's not what they're saying. No, I'm talking about revolution in attitude. And there's a statement you made that the greatest threat to freedom is the absence of criticism. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of thinking, how do you get our leaders to be more sensitive to what concerns us? You know, even during this pandemic, people are being critical of the elites as they see them, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of still looking out for themselves. What does the average person do beyond getting worked up mm -hmm. uh, to engage our leaders to be more sensitive to our needs? Mm. More pressure groups and more consistent. Uh, because uh, our people, uh, they lose things, they, they drop things too easily. In fact, it's, it's what exhausts me sometimes. And I say to myself, what's, what's happened to this case? Okay. I travel out and it's dead. It's something which should agitate us continuously for a long time. Uh, whether it's some stupid, careless and provocative statement from the government, which was dropped before I went out, I come back and everything is over. Look at this, the case of the cars, 
which have been bought okay. by, uh, by the minister. Yeah, you see, so they bring in other bills, so we're busy fighting the other bills. The in the meantime, the cars are already here, mm. they've already been distributed, people yes. are already claiming them. I'm sure some of them have already sold their own, because all they want is the money, they already have the cars. So we need a bit more consistent, uh, uh, consistent attitude, and also to pick, um, uh, to use uh, the careless moment of governments to study them, to really know, to understand the kind of trouble uh, we're in. Let me give an example which I gave in a recent uh, uh, interview. You don't mind my uh, going back through it again. This, uh, it's unfortunate it concerns me, but you know, I, I think I must drop all inhibition and use every opportunity to, to I'm a teacher, and to, use, to instill trust. certain lessons mm -hmm. yeah. in people. When the killings, the other virus, uh, talking about the Boko Haram virus, the Iswap uh, virus, Aswadine virus, etc., when the, the Maya and the Mayeti, uh, the uh, herdsman virus, when it hit Mbauchi, um and the figures, uh, the, the killings, I forget the figure now, but really, startling on some other before. It took ages, even after the killings, before the president of this nation visited there. He visited there eventually, and what did he say to them? He said, oh, this after these killings, you people must learn to live together like neighbors. That was the day I gave up on that government completely. I'm telling you, completely. He said, after this absence, this unbelievable absence, you go there and your message is that they should learn. You didn't come there as a commander in chief, as a leader, and say, the culprits will be punished, I assure you, and security will be given. But no, didn't. You see, it's that kind of leadership which trickles down yes. and enables some of his courts. There's this uh, Garbash, uh, what's his name? Uh, the fellow who wants me to turn pandemic into a Nollywood film. <laughs> I made a statement which I've never forgotten because again, I picked it up on the outside. And when I came back, I wanted to see if papers, if the media had noticed, when he said that Governor Orton and his government were just putting up a show. This is with caskets, lined up, and he pointed this, he has lined up the casket, the mass burial, and he brought in the international media to give a show. That's as much as we can take on this first edition. Time flies when you're fully engaged. So the next edition, when we continue to thrash out national and world affairs with the erudite Professor Wale Shoinka on our one-on-one -on -one exclusive on Plus TV Africa, I am Ekene Ezeji.